It's working. Well, good morning, everyone. Are you there? Good morning. Okay. Okay. That's that's a little better. Why are we here today? I mean, it's not the weekly Sabbath. I understand that. And most of you, for some reason or another, as we just saw from the response back to, from the crowd, don't seem quite as vocal, as happy, maybe as joyous, celebrating as you normally are on the Sabbath day. I can't imagine why. But you know, what's even more weird and even more peculiar, at least by the world standards, is why are you today afflicting yourself? Why are you intentionally and with forethought making yourself uncomfortable? As I was telling my wife on the way over, I think it was just about we hit 220. I said, hmm, I feel a hunger pain. Won't be the, it, wasn't, it was the first, but it won't be the last, I'm sure, before sometime after 7, depending upon where you are tonight. Why would anyone want to do that? Is it maybe a little bit because it's like banging your head against a wall? It feels so good when you stop. Uh, that's part of it, I guess. Uh, some have thought on their very first day of atonement, uh, my children did, that they were going to die. That there's no way they could go all day without food or water. It's not possible. Now, before you think we were ogres, we did not force any of our children as they were growing up to fast on atonement. We left it up to them at what age, what time they wanted to do it. All of them began it. I don't remember what ages they were when they finally began doing it. <clears throat> However, I do remember one particular atonement service. We were going to the feast in Lake Tahoe. Uh, actually, we were in Squaw Valley that particular year. And I uh, remember that year really well because it snowed the night of atonement. We went to bed, and the next morning we woke up and opened up the drapes on the blinds in the hotel we were in, and the mountains were covered with snow. So we had to go down and get chains and you know get everything fixed up on the car, go get the kids' boots and everything else because we were right in the middle of snow up there. But uh, when, when you're in a motel room and your kids want to eat and it's atonement, you have to order in and bring it up to the, to the room. That was a tough atonement. My kids all sitting there eating breakfast and us in the same motel room with them. <laughs> Boy, that smells good. So, <laughs> at home now, you know, there's no food, there's nothing to smell, so we don't bother quite so much. But they did not die, and, you know, you will not either. Long about 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock this afternoon, however, you may begin to feel like you're going to, but I don't think you will. Uh, anyone having coffee withdrawals? Some of you coffee heads out there? Or have you slowly been cutting back? I remember some people I knew who used to drink lots of coffee especially some of these people who used to work on the railroad. Uh, one friend of ours, I think he said he would drink somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 or 16 cups of coffee a day on an average basis. So he'd have to start early, sort of cutting back to, to, when he got to atonement. But you know, if we're not careful, we can take the day of atonement for granted, as well as all the other holy days. This is going to be, or is today, was last 10 days ago, my 50th Feast of Trumpets and my 50th Day of Atonement. Wow. So this is my Jubilee. Now my wife's ahead of me, so, you know. How many of you have by chance celebrated as many as 50? Observed more than 50, okay. She's an old head. She's been around a long time. She was, are you, you're frowning. You don't remember that? Okay. <laughs> I'll, get, I'll pay for that later. <laughs> Old, only in the sense of the number of years that she is ahead of me in observing the feast days. But in, in, in the sense that we sometimes take these things for granted and forget about them, because I've had people say, oh, tomorrow's atonement, or, you know, like it, it snuck up on them somehow or another. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, and you don't necessarily need to turn there, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, in speaking to Timothy, and this time Timothy, as you know, was a young preacher, young minister, he said, preach the word, be instant in season. And that's something we've always felt was an admonition for those of us who speak from time to time, that in season, on the holy days, you speak about the holy days. My old friend Ron Dart used to tell me that 
he learned more about the holy days every year because he prepared a message every year on the holy days. And after you've done it, you know, 40, 50, 60 times, whatever it was, you begin, you don't take it for granted, but you begin to, to learn more and more about it and realize more yourself. So that's what we're here today. We're here in season. Uh, there's a, he goes on to say later in that particular verse of 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort with long suffering and doctrine. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. In effect, the doctrine of the Day of Atonement. Uh, the scripture over in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 23, it also says, A word spoken again in due season, how good it is. And I think if you came to a service on the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and someone spoke on something totally, completely unrelated to that, you might have a little question about, you know, why they were doing that. Hopefully it would have some relationship, but we're going to talk about the Day of Atonement today. It goes on to say in that same scripture in verse 24 in Proverbs 15, that the way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from the hell beneath. So what we're striving to do today is to go to this way of life, which is above to the wise. You know, from time to time, is, is, and these scriptures are just some of them, God also advises us within the scripture to review and to reprove why we're going to do this. At some point in time, every one of you in this room, at some time, prove to yourself, this is what you needed to do. This was what you wanted to do. But from time to time, it's good for us to review it, you know, go over it, because that is one of the best ways to learn is to repeat, to continue to repeat and repeat and repeat what we're doing. So what is this day? And why am I, just like you, consciously and deliberately afflicting myself, to use the biblical term? The very first reason is, as the well-known Detective Sherlock Holmes says, very elementary, my dear Watson. We are commanded to. Even the children know that that have attended very many services. Our children learn that very early on. And when we would go over the scriptures, this is something that God told us, or told us that we should do. God commands us to do this. In Leviticus chapter 23, Johnny stole a little bit of my thunder here, but we'll, won't hurt to repeat it again. In verse 26, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, On the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. That's what we're here for. It shall be a holy convocation. We're going to gather together. Convocation, holy meaning separated or set aside. Convocation meaning a gathering together. So this is a day that is set aside for us to come together before God. Holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls. Now, without getting into a lot of technical you know, definitions, we'll look at some. How do we know that to afflict your soul means to fast? Well, there's quite a few scriptures that we can go over that tell us that. I think it's new news. I mean, not new news to any of you. It's old news. You understand that. But it's what we are doing today. And to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, and you should do no work in that same day. Now, that, most of us, we don't have a problem with that. We, we like it. We don't have to do any work. Uh, you know, it's good to get off from work. For it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, there are consequences of not fasting. The same shall be cut off from among his people. And whoso, whatsoever soul it be that does any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It's a day that God wants us to specifically focus in and be able to focus in because we're not working. We're not worrying about preparing meals. And then, it's not a worry, I guess, or a bother to eat the meal. But it is preparation, as you ladies well know, uh, to prepare a meal, especially a big meal or something like that. So this is a day especially that is to be set aside for us to have our mind on God and on this calling and on this day. It goes on to say, It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. And it shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even shall you celebrate. So we are supposed to celebrate. We are supposed to observe this Sabbath. Most of you probably know, remember, that the word atonement comes from the original Hebrew word kippur. Of course, it is called, and if you read in the newspapers, they're talking about Yom Kippur 
is coming up, the Jewish people are coming up. The, the, the root of that word is kafar, and it means simply to cover, to cleanse, to forgive, to pardon, to purge, to reconcile, all within that framework of, of meanings. And then, of course, we went over what we're talking about when we talk about a holy convocation. One of the places that you're probably familiar with, and it's an old hat probably to many of you, to where we understand what the word afflict means is found over in Ezra. Ezra chapter 8 and verse 21. Ezra chapter 8 verse 21 says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before God to seek of Him a right way for us. And I'm going to mention this again a little bit later. But because Artis, uh, Ezra, if you will remember, had received a commission from Artaxerxes to return from the Babylonian captivity and to go to Jerusalem to begin rebuilding the city, rebuilding the wall. So they stopped here on the way because, you know, there was a lot of danger traveling those times to ask for God's help on exactly what to do. They've been gone now for 70 years. So they stopped to afflict themselves, to fast before God, to prostrate themselves, to humble themselves before God, to ask for His help, His guidance in everything that they were doing. Another scripture over in Acts chapter 27 and verse 9 says, Now when much time was spent and when the sailing was dangerous, because the fast was now already passed. If you connect those scriptures up, you know again that it's talking about the Day of Atonement. And it was many times just referred to simply as the fast day, and not necessarily the Day of Atonement. I think the first question that we need to ask and need to answer is why do we fast? We know we're supposed to fast, but why do we fast? Other than because of the fact that we're given a commandment to do it. I mean, that's very elementary. We mentioned that. In Ezra chapter 8, why did God respond to the self-affliction, the afflicting of the soul, the fasting? Would he have done it otherwise? If Ezra had simply just prayed to God, and the people that were with him had just prayed to him, would God have responded? Probably. So why did Ezra fast? And why did he have the people that were with him fast on that particular day? Because it wasn't, it wasn't the Day of Atonement. At least I don't think I've ever tracked that back. I don't think it was. Has anybody ever done that, tracked it back to see if that happened to fall on the Day of Atonement? I just thought that just hit my brain all of a sudden. I've never thought about that, but I, I doubt very seriously if it was. But why did God respond to him because of this self-infliction. Is God somehow or another impressed with us because we are self-afflicting ourselves today? Does God respond to us because we are in pain or discomfort? Well, I think you know the answer. That's rather rhetorical. He's not. He is not impressed with our discomfort, but rather with the meaning of our fast, why we are fasting. We'll talk to you about a, a very well-known story in the Bible with the prophet Elijah. If you remember in 1 Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 27, it says, It came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. Now, who is Elijah mocking? I don't want to go back to the whole thing. I'll just explain it briefly. If you remember, this is the time and the period where he's dealing with Ahab. And Ahab, as you well know and probably remember, was the wickedest of kings. And Ahab was falling upon the prophets of Baal. And so Elijah has, says, we're going to have a little contest here. Set aside two bullocks, one for you, one for us. You build your altar, I'll build my altar in effect. And you can get your God to bring down fire from heaven. And then we will know truly who is the real God. You remember the story? It goes on in this particular section of it. Um, it says it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them because they had been doing everything they could possibly do, wailing and carrying on, you know, calling for Baal to come down and start the fire. It says, cry aloud, for he is a God. Or he, he, he's probably saying, he is a God. Uh, he, maybe he's talking. You don't interrupt him. Maybe he is pursuing or he's on a journey. Or peradventure he may be asleep. And you must wake him up. So they cried aloud. And then they cut themselves after the manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out of them. What happened? Nothing. 
And you remember the story of what Elijah did. He got the bullock out they had, covered it up with water, put water all the way around it, covered everything with water until it was floating just about. And then God, of course, set it on fire and sucked up all the water. But see, there's just another case of where God, even if it was their God, if they had a God that could do that, God's not impressed with the people cutting themselves with, with knives or whatever. He's not impressed with us afflicting ourselves voluntarily today and making ourselves uncomfortable. But he is responsible for, he is impressed by the fact that we are sincere in what we do. Now again, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, Ahab was a very, very, very wicked king. In 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30, it says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. So it tells us here, and it'll tell us later, that he was more evil than any that followed him as well. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Then skipping down to 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 25, and says again, But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all the things as he did with the Amorites, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. But if you remember the story, God had said he was going to destroy Ahab. Yet God changed his mind. He repented of his proclamation against Ahab. And he did not kill him. Why would God change his mind about a man who was described as the most wicked of kings to ever come around? Why would he do that? Well, in, in verse 27, it said, It came to pass when Ahab heard the words of Elijah, that he rent his clothes, he put sackcloth upon his flesh, and he fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, See how Ahab humbles himself before me. And because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. That's amazing, if you think about it. Here's a man that had done so much evil, and so many people knew it. Everybody knew what God had proclaimed about him. Yet Ahab's fast and his actions showed absolute humility before God when Elijah you know, came before him. Another example. You all remember the story of Jonah. Remember God came to Jonah and said, Go to the city of Nineveh, and I have a message you need to take to them. And we're, we won't go through all the way, you know, he had to try to get away from doing that, but eventually God got his attention. So in Jonah chapter 3, in verse 5, after Jonah had gone through the streets and told them that in so many days, you know, the city was going to fall. It says, so the people of Nineveh believed God. What did they do? They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even unto the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, he laid his robe from off him, and he covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat in ashes. He caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout all of Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his noble saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And what happened? In verse 10, God saw their works, that they had turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Can God's mind be changed? I rest my case on the evidence. Can we change God, in effect, no matter 
how far down that bad road or evil way we might have gone. Absolutely. God repented. He changed his mind because all the people, including the king, including the, the, all the animals, in effect, changed and turned from their evil. But why is it specifically that you and I are fasting on this Day of Atonement? We've seen these examples. We know we ought to fast. Why is it we're fasting? Let's, look at, let's think about that and then let's look at a couple of scriptures. first one is found over in Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16, beginning in verse 29. And again, he's speaking of this day. He says, And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all. Same thing we had seen earlier in Leviticus. It goes on to say, Whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourns among you. So if you've got somebody even passing through that you're responsible for, they are supposed to fast as well. For that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And it shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and you shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. This shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. This was speaking in this particular case of Aaron. Now, I'm going to skip. We've seen this from the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament. Let's skip over now to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. <clears throat> Excuse me. Beginning in verse 1. It says, Then verily the first covenant, the first testament, had also ordinances of a divine service and of a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, or the holy of holies. Then skipping down from verse 3 down to verse 6, it says, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest, high priest, went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second tabernacle went the high priest alone. The other priests could go into the first, but only the high priest could go into the second or the holiest of holies. And he could only go when? Once. Every year on this day, the Day of Atonement. And not without blood before he tried to accomplish the service of God. Um, I'm sorry, but not without blood, which he offered for himself and then for the heirs of the people. The Holy Spirit this signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing under the old covenant, which was a figure of the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. If those sacrifices at that time made that person you know, perfect, why did they continue to do it year after year. And that's the reason it says he didn't. It did not accomplish that. Which stood only in verse 10 in meats and drinks and diverse washings and cardinal ordinances and post upon them until the time of reformation. But Christ in verse 11, Christ in verse 11, being come and high priest of good things to come, goes on to say, by a greater and a more perfect tabernacle, one not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats or of calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean is sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself one who was without spot to God to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that which were, were called might receive the promise of internal, eternal inheritance. Then skipping to verse 24, it says... For Christ, he has not entered into the holy places made with hands, 
which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest did, entering into the holy place every year with the blood of others, for others. For then must he have often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once, in the end of the world, has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. You see the very close relationship, and you've probably heard this talked about before, between the Passover season and the Day of Atonement. They're so interrelated and so intertwined and so much a complement of each other, in effect. Then in verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto him that look for him, do we look for him? Did we on the Feast of Trumpets celebrate, as it were, looking to the return of Jesus Christ? For those that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. The Day of Atonement symbolizes the union of us as mankind to God. There's a scripture over in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. Many of you may have it memorized. It says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't say some. It says all. It covers everybody in here. We cannot come before God. We cannot come before His presence because God will not be in the presence of sin. In Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2, it says, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. That's a part of the trumpet message that may have, the Scripture may have been even read on the Day of Trumpets. That we as the people who are assigned the task of the watchman. You see over in Ezekiel 33, this is part of the message in Isaiah 59 verse 2 that we need to be proclaiming. After the return of Christ, which again we celebrated 10 days ago, or look forward to for the Feast of Trumpets, and then the binding of Satan that we see over in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 2. I'm not going to go there. It's a scripture you're probably all familiar with. This binding of Satan then renders him, in effect, inactive. And I think we all know, and I think we all understand, that the evils of human nature are, in effect, the result of the attitudes and the, the teachings, the, the proclivities, the leadings of Satan. And as long as he is active, there will be evil present in this world. On this day, the Day of Atonement, in the future, the sins of the world will be correctly placed on the head of Satan. And he will be bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And there will be no evil active in this world during that period of time. However, at the same time, you and I should not in any way, and we cannot, diminish our own active role <clears throat> excuse me, in sin. For while this day, this day of atonement, may represent, and it does represent, the uniting of God and man, it is only through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through His atoning sacrifice, the blood He shed for us, that we may unite with God. It is only through that sacrifice. He is our sin offering. He is our atonement. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26 it says, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. But we continue, you and I, to sin. Unfortunately, we're not of that ability, persuasion, or whatever, that once we go down to the waters of baptism, and come up cleansed from all of our sins to never sin again after that. But Christ says, all you have to do is effect, is repent. All you have to do is change and accept my atoning sacrifice for you. I died for you. 
He died for me. And that's very much what this day is all about. <clears throat> but again, why are we fasting today? I want you to think about that question. Why are we fasting? Let's turn over, if you would, to the book of Isaiah. <clears throat> In Isaiah chapter 58, and again, this is a part of this message that I mentioned earlier of the watchman. Isaiah chapter 58, beginning in verse 1. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, Cry aloud, spare not, don't hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people, or my margin renders it, tell my people. Tell my people their transgressions in the house of Jacob, their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinances of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and that you see not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and you take no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure, and you exact your labor. Behold, you fast for strife and for debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as the bulrush to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and an acceptable day unto the Lord? But is this not instead the fast that I have chosen? The fast that you and I need to be doing today in all of our lives. To loose the bands of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens. To let the oppressed go free. And that you break every yoke. Is that not the message that we as a congregation, that we as a church need to be publishing to this world so that this world understands what the message coming from God is. To loose the bands of the wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke. Is it not to deal the bread to the hungry, to bring to the poor that are cast out of the house? When you see the naked, you cover them. You hide not yourself from your own flesh. Then, after these fast, after this type of a fast, shall the light break forth as the morning, and your health shall spring forth speedily, and the righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. He will be coming up behind, protecting us. Then, when this is done, shall you call, and the Lord shall answer. You shall cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If you take away from the midst of you the yoke, and the putting forth of the finger, and speaking of vanity. You ever shook your finger in the face of anybody? Can get yourself hurt sometimes doing that. We can really get ourselves hurt if we shake our fist, our finger, in the face of God. If we say we're doing one thing and we do another. So why are we fasting? If you draw out your soul to the hungry, if you satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall your light rise, and the darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide you continually, and satisfy your soul in drought, and make fat your bones, and you shall be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. Tremendous blessings. A picture drawn, in effect, almost a, sort of like the old picture we have of the Garden of Eden. Skipping on down, down to chapter 59. <clears throat> Pick it up again in verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is he ear heavy that he cannot hear. You remember the examples we just went through of Ahab? Did he hear Ahab? Did he repent? Did he hear Ezra when he was there at the river Ahava on the way back to Jerusalem? Did he hear 
the territory of Nineveh. Was the Lord's hands shortened that he could not save, nor his ear heavy that he could not hear? But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongues have muttered perverseness. None calls for justness, nor any pleads for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. You would think they were talking about today. Does this describe the world that we're living in today? Or does it not? If you've watched any of these presidential debates so far that have gone forth, um, they're trying to call for justice. They're trying to call for truth. They're trying not to speak lies, although I wonder sometimes. Um, we're in trouble, folks, as a nation. This world is in trouble. There's only one solution. That's the return of Jesus Christ. But in the meantime, we have a job to do. We have a message to scream to the top of our voice to the world around us. And you know the most effective sermon, the most effective message that has ever existed? The life that we live. That we hear the cries of the hungry, of the poor. That our life is lived in such a way that the example is that the people around us say, I want to know what you know. I want to be a part of what you're a part of. Because, you know, believe it or not, people watch you. Most people that you know that are not a part of the churches of God know what you proclaim. Do we in our daily life live up to that every day? Do we know that people are sometimes watching us? Is it possible that sometimes our example, the things that we do in secret thinking, thinking turn somebody else away? God forbid. Skipping now down from verse 4 down to verse 7. It says, Their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not. There is no judgment in their going, no justice in their goings. They have made them crooked paths, and whosoever goes therein shall not know peace. And I'm going to skip over to verse 12. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins they testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from heart the words of falsehood. Judgment is turned away backwards. Justice stands far off. For the truth has fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth fails, and he that departs from evil makes himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with the zeal of a clo as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay. Fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, and to the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion. And unto them that then turn from their transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, those who turn away, those who teach these words, those who live these words, says the Lord. My spirit is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth, nor out of the mouth of your seed, nor out of the mouth of your seed seed, says the Lord, from henceforth and forever. A promise made to each of us 
who are living our life, who are doing as God has instructed us to do, would it be appropriate on the day that we are to be united with God, on the day that we are individually acknowledging that we have been separated, we have been alienated from God because of our sins, that we should be feasting and rejoicing on a day that in all of its makeup and everything that we know about it demands and requires a repentant attitude. It requires humility and the abject submission of our will to the will of God. A day that required the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior is our atonement in our individual acceptance of Christ for our own personal expiation of those sins. It would almost seem, since this day represents Satan getting his due, that the sins of the world will be placed upon Satan and he'll be banished for a thousand years, that we would want to rejoice. But in Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 17 it says, Rejoice not when your enemy falls. Let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. So is this a day we should you know, be feasting and rejoicing? No, it's not. Lest, in that sense of the word, it appear that we are ignoring our own responsibility for our own sins. On the Day of Atonement, we fast. We voluntarily afflict ourselves. But as I mentioned earlier, God receives no pleasure in that other than the fact that we are being obedient to Him. We don't fast just because, although it would be enough, God has commanded us to. Our fasting is a fasting that hopefully is not without results. It is something that we do that is with meaning. It has, it's not that it doesn't have meaning. It has meaning. This is not some meaningless spiritual exercise that we come to you know, we can tell people that we know we're going to fast all day tomorrow and, you know, let them pat us on the back. We are saying in our fast, we are saying to God our Father and to Jesus Christ our Savior, our elder brother, our higher priest and our King who sits at the Father's right hand side, I repent and I appear before you today in total and abject humility in recognition of my own personal sins, in absolute repentance of those sins, and that I desperately want and that I desperately need to be made at one with you. For in fact, I must be made at one with you, because if we're not, we will not become one with God. Before this whole world can become one with God, the things that we've talked about today must take place. That great adversary, that great enemy, Satan, must be bound and put away. And that is pictured by this day. The ultimate atoning sacrifice of Christ for our sins, the binding of Satan, all these are, in effect, reflected on this day. But one thing more, the thing that I can continue to talk about, you and I must humble ourselves before God. Not just today, but for the rest of our life. But our fast today is that outward expression of our humility. But the real reason we fast is that we must have a complete and total inward humility. You know, when in Nineveh, when they put the, the head of the fast, they put the sackcloth all over and they sat in the ashes. All these were outward expressions. Again, God is not impressed with that. What he is impressed with is how we feel in our heart. How we live our life that reflects how we feel. The total humility of my heart it's got to be totally humble before God before we can be accepted as one with our Father. Today, are you content with your life? Is life full and enjoyable? 
Are you fully satisfied with where you are in your relationship with God? Are you fasting today because God commanded it? Or is it because we do recognize, we do acknowledge our uncleanness, our transgressions, our weakness without Him? The children's prayer that says, we are weak, but you are strong. That's our prayer too. Because that's where we get our strength. Through God. Because we can do all things through Him which strengthens us. Our fast today is simply an outward manifestation of our inward humility and our inward attitude. That of recognizing our great need for the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ to cover our sins. So why is it that you're fasting today?